Good morning, everybody, and thank you, thank you for in, in, uh, joining us in such great numbers. We're delighted to have you. My name is Claire Lord, and I'm the head of the corporate governance team at Mason Hayes and Curran. I'm joined by two of my colleagues. I have Gronia Garveo, who's a senior associate on the, on the corporate governance team. And I also have David Ormsby, who's a partner in our restructuring and insolvency practice. Gronia and I will lead today's presentation, but we asked David to join in the event that there might be questions relevant to his practice area when we move to the question and answers session. On our team, one of the practice areas that keeps us busy is designing and implementing solvent restructuring projects. These projects um, tend to involve moving companies within a group or moving assets and liabilities between group companies. These projects tend to be driven by a number of factors. These include tax, pre-sale hiveouts, post-sale integration, or group-driven streamlining. And these projects can also involve taking companies out of a group structure. Today's webinar will focus on this last point, the simplification of a group structure. Often a group will comprise companies that are dormant or relatively inactive. And while these companies may once have served a very valid purpose, this may no longer be the case. In our experience, when organizations compare the benefits of maintaining these companies with the costs and risks of doing so, they often reach the conclusion that their group would be better served without them. And at a time when the global economy is being severely impacted by the effects of COVID-19, organizations are looking at ways to reduce costs and improve, improve business efficiencies. And organizations may also have the time now to implement in particular, in particular projects that will lead to these long-term savings. So simplifying your corporate structure might be one such project. So obviously cost saving is likely to be an attractive benefit, but there are other benefits of corporate simplification that are worthy of mention, and I will get to these shortly. But we'll stay briefly on the topic of costs. The immediate cost savings from having one less company will be audit and compliance costs. But we must also remember the cost savings from not having employee time taken up with managing the administration and maintenance of, of what might be superfluous companies. And I've also mentioned business efficiency. Eliminating unnecessary companies does allow management and legal teams and compliance teams to focus their time on the core companies required to run and grow the business. Another very important factor is the mitigation of risk. A dormant company can be a vehicle for fraud as a result um, of less oversight, but it is more likely to present an issue when compliance deadlines are missed. An important factor in all of this is that all of these things can lead to increased exposure for the directors of the company who may also be executives of the group. Having less companies also makes it easier to ensure that group compliance with ever-changing legal and corporate governance requirements are met and are consistently met. Ensuring that companies are meeting the required standards is an ongoing challenge, but it's far easier to maintain high standards with a less complex group structure. Transparency, an ever increasingly important thing, um, can be achieved through a simplified structure, and this is likely to be welcomed by investors, finance providers, and other stakeholders. And I mentioned tax, which is often the very first reason that simplification might be looked at. Very simply, your structure, simplifying your structure can um, resolve tax inefficiencies and allow for improved tax planning. And finally, a benefit that Grania is going to spend a little bit of time covering in more detail is the benefit of taking the time now, when business might be quiet, to take on a project that will result in cost savings and business efficiencies but that can also bring the benefit of demonstrating to your people that you are committed to the future and utilizing their time now in a productive way. So I have spoken a little bit um, about um, corporate simplifications. So we're gonna ask you to do a, a wee bit of work um, and it, we're gonna take a poll. So we've three questions for you. 
And the first is, do you know on average the cost of maintaining a dormant or relatively inactive company per year? So I'd ask you there to, to vote. You can go with less than two and a half thousand, four thousand, eight thousand or above ten pounds. Take a think and, and, and let us know and we'll let you know the answer at the end. We don't want to give anything away. We have another question coming up. Your work's not done yet. So the second question, do you believe that your current corporate structure could benefit from corporate simplification? So we've, we've three options here. Yes, no, undecided. We also like undecided because that means potentially there's, 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 um, there's, there's a possibility of, 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 uh, of simplifying your structure. Let us know what you think with that one and we can move on to the third question. So the third and final question. What do you believe is the main obstacle to simplifying the corporate structure in an organization? So the, we have five options here. External legal costs, time constraints, availability of internal tax, legal and compliance teams due to workload, all of the above, no obstacle. So have a think about those. And once again, we'll, we'll make you wait till the end. Once we've, 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 we've answers there, we can, we can move on to the rest of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And as I said, we'll come back to the answers um, towards the end of the webinar. So before we move on to um, actually how you might go about achieving a reduced structure, I thought I'd put up a picture. Um, and this is a notional group. Um, but often a picture speaks a thousand words, so I, I thought it might set the scene before we moved into the next part. What we have here is, is a, a global group. It's got two Irish holding companies because it's got two distinct trades and it wants to keep those, but it's been rather acquisitive and it's over the years it has, it has, bought, um, it has bought other entities and it has, it has tried other trades and, and, and done, done different things and, and uh, essentially progressed and grown its business. So we're going to look at the left hand side first and we've got a higher trading company and a lower trading company that actually owns an asset and that could well be there to assist with giving security to a lender but they may no longer be that need it may be associated with some trading activities and um, but not a lot um, but it could well be a, a company that that might be a little bit more complicated to to wind up in the old-fashioned way such as moving the asset and liquidating it um, but certainly consideration needs to be given if a separate entity is needed. There's also a dormant entity, definitely dormant, does nothing, and a legacy entity that we're just not sure about. What are possibilities here? Obviously subject to diligence and, and working out what the companies used to do, uh, what they hold, what they do now, would be to merge the, the, the lower asset company up into the trading entity. And that could be done by merger by absorption, which is something Ronya will speak about a little later on. We could, we could wind up the, 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 the dormant entity using the voluntary strike-off procedure and the legacy entity we could do the same or we could maybe do a member's voluntary liquidation there where, where there might be some concern of, of, of potentially creditors still, still out there in terms of, of the tail um, and the ability to restore the company to the register which is something I'll also um, come, come back to shortly. Now we'll move back and we look to the right hand side which is a little simpler. We have a trading entity we have a dormant entity and we've one with limited activity. Um, that limited activity is actually relevant to the trading entity. Um, so consideration could be given to how we might merge it into the trading entity. So what we could do is a different merger process, which is the merger by acquisition. And again, Ronya will look at this shortly. And the dormant entity could be dealt with as the dormant entity was dealt with on the other side. And that gives us a much more stream streamlined company We've two trading entities that do include previous entities. Um, and again, Gronia will, will speak a little bit about what this actually means. So now I think we can move on to the how. We're going to focus on two hows in particular, um, the, the one-step how and the two-step how. Now, the one-step how is the domestic merger process. And by, by calling it one-step, um, the, the, I mean that, that it is essentially 
um, it, the, the two things, the, the removal of the assets, if there are any, and the dealing with of the liabilities and the dissolution of the entity are dealt with in one process. What the merger process allows an entity to do is to transfer assets and liabilities from one entity to another by operation of Irish law. And then the transferring entity will be dissolved without going into liquidation. It's a relatively new process. It came in under our 2014 Act and Grania will spend some time looking at this option. I'm going to look at the two-step option, the more old-fashioned option, but old-fashioned doesn't, um, doesn't mean bad, it doesn't mean not useful, um, it's perfectly adequate and, and, and in some instances the better process, depending on, as I've said, what might be in an entity or what an entity used to do or might now do. In terms of considering um, the two-step process. So this involves transferring all of the assets out of, out of the company and sub subsequently winding it up using either the voluntary strike-off procedure or the member's voluntary liquidation. And there are considerations as to which of these processes might be more suitable. I will, I will talk about the processes in a little detail, but I'm going to give an overview now. We'll look initially at why it's important to understand what, stand what the companies do or used to do. Um, so for example, you can only apply to voluntarily strike off a company where the company has never carried on a business or has ceased to carry on a business. You, you can only, you, you also need to be, to be aware if you choose the voluntary strike off procedure that there is no finality for some time um, or no that there, there is an ability for, for a tail, for creditors to look to restore the company. Um, the, 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 this, pro, this means that a member, so there's two processes. That within the first year, a member or officer of the company can apply to the registrar of companies to have the company restored within one year of strike off. Um, but for 20 years, creditors, the company, members and officers can apply to the court to have the company restored. So it would be often the case that a company where there's uncertainty about creditors in particular, where that might have been a very active trading entity um, at, at, at one stage, would not look to wind itself up using the voluntary strike-off procedure. The member's voluntary, voluntary liquidation procedure does allow for finality a little sooner, but it's not immediate. So if you choose a member's voluntary liquidation process, um, to dissolve a company, the liquidator or any person who appears to the court to be interested can apply to have the dissolution declared void within two years of dissolution. So that's why it's important to know what companies used to do before deciding what to do with them. It's also important to know what's in a company before deciding how to get rid of it. Um, and this then goes back to the original point of transferring the assets out. What's in there and how do you get it out? To, voluntar to, to voluntarily strike off a company, um, it can have no more than 150 euro worth of, of assets or liabilities. So essentially, if there is anything in there in excess of those amounts, they need to be dealt with before the process can be started. If you're considering an MVL, while it's not necessarily the case, it is often considered more efficient to present a liquidator with, um, with an empty entity, so that an entity where the assets and liabilities have been dealt with. But more importantly, because the MVL process requires the directors to declare that the company is solvent, they will prefer assets and liabilities to be dealt with before they have to give that declaration. On the upside, if you, if you clear the company out beforehand, if there are surplus assets, they get to the member quicker than waiting for a liquidation process to be completed and them being distributed in specie as part of that process. We'll look now at how you actually get the assets out or what the options are for taking assets out of the company if there are. You first need to work out what's in there um, and if there are any assets in there, ideally you would look to transfer any assets in order to have the ability to settle any residual liabilities and in a perfect situation to be able to, to distribute any surplus up to your member. But there may often be impediments to this. Um, if you transfer assets, what's the value of those assets? What will the consideration be? And will this be sufficient to settle its liabilities? Where it is, or where a decision is made just to distribute the assets up to the members, does the company have sufficient profits available for distribution to do so? If it hasn't been trading, it may not, but there are other things that can assist in the creation of profits available for distribution. 
So the company might perhaps have a high share capital, it might have a share premium, and that can be considered for share capital or, or company capital reduction in order to create realized profits, which if there are no realized losses, can actually form profits available for distribution that can facilitate that distribution. There's also the possibility of considering a contribution of gifts or assets to another group entity. But consideration where this is being looked at needs to be given whether this might actually trigger a deemed distribution. So care does need to be taken in this regard. Looking now at the aspects of the VSO, the Voluntary Strike-Off, and the MBL, Members' Voluntary Liquidation and Procedures. We'll start with the VSO procedure. Voluntary strike-off can be attractive. Um, it's considered more of an administrative process for dissolving a company. Um, you do it by way of application to the Registrar of Companies. Um, and that, 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 I guess, says it's quicker, cheaper, and more efficient. But as I said, it can only be used in limited circumstances. And the quid quo, quo pro for, for having this type of, of strike-off means that there are considerations that it isn't actually suitable for, for, for some entity types. As I've mentioned, um, in order to, to undertake this process, the company can't have assets or liabilities in excess of 150 euro. It can't be a party to ongoing or pending liquidation and all of its statutory filings must be up to date. It also has to ensure that it's not carrying on business or, or currently um, that, that it has never traded or it has presently ceased to trade. It obviously, you, you have to ensure that creditors have been paid and all tax affairs are up to date. And a very impo important point to be remembered is that if it has not divested itself of all the assets and there's an asset left inadvertently in the entity, that vests in the state and the company has to be restored to the register which will mean bringing all statutory filings up to date, which will include audited accounts um, in order to get that asset back. So that's a very important consideration. Another thing that, that needs to be um, remembered is that the liabilities of any officers of the company will continue and can be enforced as if the company had not been dissolved. Uh, um, so that, that, and that obviously goes to the tail, this, this 20 year period when a creditor can potentially have the company restored to the register. So moving on now to look at the, um, the procedure for a member's voluntary liquidation. Um, it is a more involved process. It does involve more parties, um, but I guess the reduction of the tail to the two-year ability to restore the company does make sometimes that the, the, the more involved prospect um, a, more, a, a more attractive, makes this a more attractive option. Members essentially appoint a liquidator and that liquidator looks into the affairs of the company, settles liabilities and essentially can distribute surplus assets then to the members. Um, the members voluntary liquidation is commenced using what is now called the summary approval procedure. Ronnie will also speak about this process in the context of a merger, which is largely similar, but there are some differences. The main things to be aware of in respect of this procedure when undertaking the MVL process is the requirement for the directors to give a declaration of solvency, which means that the company must be solvent and the directors must be able to say that they've made a full inquiry into the affairs of the company and have formed the opinion that the company will be able to pay its debts within 12 months from the commencement of the winding up. Directors need to satisfy themselves that they can give this declaration. They will usually have reference to the last set of audited financial statements um, they will also look for up-to-date um, management accounts. They may look for, um, uh, they may look for um, confirmation of, of other things from the company's finance team, perhaps from external auditors. And they may look for some form of, um, of indemnity or letter of support from a higher holding company in the event that there might be, might be some concerns. The, the reason that, that directors need to um, exercise utter care in giving that declaration is that they can have personal liability in circumstances um, where giving the, the, the declaration was, was, was not reasonable of them and or the company goes into insolvent liquidation with, within that period of 12 months um, from, from, from the commencement of the winding up process. The declaration of solvency needs to be accompanied by an independent person's report confirming that the declaration is not unreasonable. The independent person can be the company's statutory auditor and often is. Um, there's additional cost, obviously, with this, and time needs to be built into the process, 
as a as a mini audit tends to to be done for in very complex circumstances. As I've said, there's the two year tail that um, that is, is is relevant in that a company can be restored to the register within two years of the date of dissolution, and that obviously needs to be to be kept in mind. We've now come to the part of the talk where we're going to speak about domestic mergers. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Gornia Garvale, um, who, will, who will bring you through this process. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Gornia Garvale. As Claire mentioned, I'm a senior associate in the corporate governance department. So I work with a lot of clients in terms of looking at their structures and looking at simplification projects or also implementing pre or post-sale restructuring projects. So I'm going to talk about domestic mergers, as Claire has already said. And she's already said that they do. They were first introduced in the uh, when the Irish Companies Act came into effect in 2014. Um, they stem from the EU cross-border regulations. So there are similarities, but there are differences as well. And I think it's important to be aware of that. Um, when they were first introduced, there was quite a slow uptake. Um, and I suppose at the start, it was more dormant, relatively inactive companies that may only have been holding one asset they really wanted to keep. Um, and those entities were used in the merger process. But more and more, we're definitely seeing an increase in large companies and companies with really big balance sheets who are actually using mergers as a way of simplifying their structures. So if you look at, Claire just clicks down there, the aspects of the procedure. So as she's mentioned, you know, what, what is a merger? So in a merger, the assets and liabilities of the transfer of company, known as the transferor, um, are going to pass by operation of law to the successor entity, known as the successor. And then following that, the transferor is going to automatically be dissolved without going into liquidation. And I think that's quite an important point because as Claire was mentioning, kind of the old style and the new style, with, with the earlier methods of simplification, it really is a, a two-step process. But with a merger, you can actually do both those processes together. So the assets can transfer and the successor is going to automatically liquidate without any further costs or time taken up. So there's actually three different forms of merger under the Irish Companies Act. So there's merger by absorption, acquisition, and formation. And I've set out some slides to hopefully keep you all awake when I talk about mergers and the different methods between them. Um, so the first one is a merger by absorption, and this requires a parent and wholly owned subsidiary relationship. So if you look at the top slide here, the top box, we have the successor company, and that's the parent entity. And then you can see underneath the transferor marked in red, and that's a wholly owned subsidiary. And in a merger by absorption, the assets and liabilities of the transferor are going to transfer by operation of Irish law to the successor. The transferor is going to be dissolved and there's not going to be any consideration payable. So that's a, a, quite a typical method of merging entities within a corporate simplification project. So the next one we're going to look at is a merger by acquisition. Claire might just, thank you. Um, so this is slightly different. I can see here that this is often utilized for merging sister entities. Now, for the purposes of the slide, we've actually we've, we've presented an, as in there is a parent company who is the same common shareholder for each entity, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. But for the purpose of the slide, this was easier to demonstrate. So we have the transfer company here on the left, highlighted in red. And again, all of its assets and liabilities are going to pass the successor and it's going to be dissolved. And then the successor is going to be the, the company taking on those assets and liabilities. However, not only the relationship between the companies, there's also consideration payable. So that's a key difference between a merger by absorption and acquisition. And the consideration payable for the merger is going to be the allotment of shares in the capital of the successor company to the holder of shares in the transferor, which is apparent in this case. And that allotment of shares can be with or without a cash payment. Um, I suppose, how does that really work in practice? Or you know, what does that really mean if you're taking on a merger? particularly in this scenario, which, which would be a quite a common scenario when you're looking at, at corporate simplification projects where you want to merge sister entities. So in practice, what you do is you're going to ascertain the net asset value of the assets and liabilities. So you'll get the net, net asset value. And then using that, that's going to determine the number of shares that are going to be allotted. So maybe you have one share at a large premium, <coughs> excuse me, or you may issue the, the same number of shares that is going to equate the net asset value. So then if we move on to a merger by formation, <coughs> excuse me, which is the next slide. I'll just get Claire to move it on to the, thanks Claire. Um, so a merger by formation is slightly different. Um, and to be really honest, 
it's not utilized usually in a in a core simplification project and the reason for that is it's actually inserting a new company into your group structure which for most companies they don't want to put a new company in when they're actually trying to simplify and take companies out but it says one of the the, the aspects of the merger by formation is it actually allows you to merge one or more companies into a newly formed entity um, so if we just move on then to the I don't know what's happening there. Sorry about that. Um, so if you look at the different aspects of the procedure of a merger. So this is the key thing to note that a merger can actually be put into effect using the summary approval procedure that Claire spoke about, which is more colloquially known as the SAP, or by an application to court. And for our purposes, we would all say that the SAP is quicker, it's more cost efficient, and it's an internal procedure. And why do we say that, or what does that really mean? So when you do a merger by SAP using the, the summary approval procedure method, <clears throat> you're going to have a round of board meetings of both merging entities. You're going to have a 30 day inspection period and you're going to have a further round of board meetings and shareholder resolutions are going to be, are going to be signed. <clears throat> um, and for that reason, it is quite cost efficient because you know, the process is quite simple. And when I say it's an internal procedure, no one is going to know that a merger is going to be put in place unless you tell them really. Uh, the only time it's going to become a matter of public knowledge is when you make the requisite filings with the CRO after the merger has been affected. And the CRO will then process the, the documents and will change the status of the transfer war from normal to dissolved by merger. So for our purposes, we would often say it is more suitable for simplification projects where there's no solvency considerations. And I know Claire has mentioned this previously, but a declaration of solvency is required for doing a, a domestic merger um, and it is slightly different to the declaration of solvency that you would give in other procedures or other restricted activities under the Companies Act if you're familiar with them. So in a declaration of solvency in a merger, the directors of both merging entities, so the transferor and successor, are going, both going to give a declaration as, as to the ability of the successor entity to pay both its debts and the debts and liabilities of the transferor. So it is, a, it is slightly different. Um, I think one other thing that I would mention when you're looking at, looking at a merger and whether SAP is the best way to go or whether an application to court might suit you better. Um, so the real benefit of a court application is that you get this one official document, the court order which rubber stamps the merger and that could then be used in other jurisdictions or if you're looking at a registration body to confirm merger has taken place. So when you use the SAP procedure, you don't actually have that one official document. That said, like as I mentioned, the, our domestic legislation does stem from EU leg legislation. Um, and a lot of countries will have similar domestic merger legislation and equally other jurisdictions outside of Europe will be very familiar with the concept of universal succession. So we've never had any issues with being able to make registrations or producing documents to other jurisdictions because what we have seen in our experience is they will accept the same proofs that you give the CRO uh, together with confirmation that the merger has taken place or even a, a notarial certificate confirming the merger. Um, the other key aspect that I'd note, and, and as Claire spoke about, you know, the, the kind of the sting in the tail of MVLs and VSOs, which is the ability of restoration or unwinding the liquidation for a certain period, there actually is no way to undo a merger. So it can't be undone and the, and the dissolved company cannot be restored. There just isn't a mechanism in the Companies Act for that. So, so they're the, the different types of merger and they're the kind of the key aspects that you need to consider. But how do you know, you know, what company within your group may be, may be suitable for a merger? Um, I suppose the, the key thing to look at and what we will always look at is understanding what's in those entities. Um, so from my perspective, I would also say that due, di due diligence is really important. Um, it's not just important so you understand what's in the entity, but that is very important, but it, but it also lends itself to determine the best method of simplification. Because as Claire mentioned, you know, if you haven't traded in years and you don't have any issues or any risks of a creditor coming out of the woodwork, you have no assets, you have no liabilities, you know, a, a VSO is probably going to be a good candidate uh, for how you simplify your structure. Um, if you have traded the legacy entity, you inherited it when you, when you, or you acquired it as part of a larger group, 
maybe you want to make sure that a liquidation process is used because you're not completely sure what's in that entity. Um, but with a merger, you're going to take on all the assets and liabilities. So you really want to know what's in the business and what's in your, the, the company you're looking at merging. So when we talk about the merge considerations, this was those four key heads that we would typically look at and consider at the outset. So the first one is going to be, what's the nature of the assets and liabilities of the transferor? Um, and we look at that because obviously everything transfers to the successor company, so they want to know what they are. But there's also some important things to note. So for example, does the transferor entity have employees? Because if it does have employees, the merger is going to trigger Chupi. And for those of you who are familiar with, with the Chupi regulations, that will mean that the employees will automatically transfer um, to the new successor entity. And as part of that procedure, there is a 30-day consultation period with the employees that you have to engage with. However, with the merger, we already have a 30-day inspection period. So that kind of lends itself quite well. And the fact of having employees and Chupi being triggered isn't going to delay the merger. Uh, another important thing we look at is, you know, do, does the transfer have any material contracts for the, the business or the organization, like supplier contracts, customer contracts, et cetera? Um, because if it does, you're really going to want to understand what the contracts say, particularly along the lines of, is there change control provisions? Is there any event of default provisions? And is the merger going to trigger any, any ability to terminate a contract, which obviously would not be in your best interest. Um, another key asset and, and liability and uh, another key question we always look at is, is there any security and financing arrangements in place? And that's actually a really important one. So where you do have security and financing arrangements in place, we would always suggest, and you should engage with your lender. Um, and while it is an internal procedure um, and you don't need consent to affect the merger, the last thing any business is going to want is to have you know, an event of default um, under their, their financing arrangements. So another head that we look at is where are the assets and liabilities of the transfer are located? Because obviously a merger is transferred by operation of Irish law. But what happens if you have an asset or liability that sits outside Ireland? And the reason we ask that is twofold. So firstly, we need to know um, because we need to understand what steps, if any, are going to be are going to have to be taken to ensure that asset transfers. But also, be, also the other reason we have to know that is because under the Companies Act, that information should go into the document, which is known as the Common Draft Terms, to um, ensure to ensure that the, that the merger does what it's supposed to do, and that is it actually transfers all the assets and liabilities. Um, and in those situations where you do have a kind of an outside or a cross-border jurisdiction element, it hasn't actually caused many difficulties because, as I mentioned, a lot of countries are familiar with universal succession and the concept of mergers. So, for example, if you had shares, if your transfer had shares in a Italian subsidiary, for example, what needs to be done to affect that change and to ensure the register of members can be updated? And in that scenario, something like a notario certificate could be presented to the company in the Italian subsidiary to ensure that the register of members of that entity can be updated. Um, so another head that we look at is tax implications. And this is an important one because a merger will trigger a, change, a charge to stamp duty. And the Irish Revenue have determined that the shareholder resolutions that are signed, which effectively give effect to the merger, that they are the, that is the stampable instrument. However, in in the case of a corporate simplification project and a group scenario, it's very likely that you're going to be able to avail of a, a stamp duty relief, such as section 79 relief. And where you do that and where you can avail of it, that's, you know, that's great. However, you do need to be aware of the clawback and you need to be aware of how claw, clawback can be triggered. Um, so if the transfer entity has, for example, a property, and that's going to move up to the successor by operation of law under a merger. And stamp duty is triggered on the merger. You apply for your relief, and that's fine. But what happens when you, when the successor company subsequently tries to sell that asset outside of the group? Is that going to, is that going to trigger clawback? So it's things like that you just need to consider. Um, and then the fourth head that we look at, which is the post-merger is post-merger registration. And I suppose that's just 
some assets and liabilities are going to trigger filings once they're transferred. So it could be property registration authority, it could be the CRO, it could be if you have patents, domain names, etc. So it's important to do due diligence to understand if there are any registrations, because then we can understand what those different bodies are going to need to ensure that the, the filings can be updated. And like I mentioned, you know, we haven't had any issues with, with updating registrations using the, the SAP procedure. So that's a kind of whistle-stop tour of what mergers are and what they do. Um, and maybe a good time, I'm sure you're all waiting with bated breath, but to see the answers of our poll results. Thank you very much, Gronia. Um, so great that there, there's the results in for the cost of maintaining a dormant or relatively inactive company per year. Um, and 35% have gone with the 4,000. Um, well, it was actually the, the, the next category up. Um, on, on average, we have found that it, it can be um, as much as 8,000 um, when, when we're taking into account the, account the cost of audit, um, annual compliance, particularly if that's outsourced, perhaps if there's a bond there for, for not having Irish resident directors. Um, so it, it's certainly not insignificant, um, particularly where you take that over a number of years, um, but also um, where there's multiple companies in respect of which these fees are perhaps unnecessarily being paid. We might move on to the next answer, please. Drum roll. Next result, I should say. <laughs> So do you believe your, your, your current corporate structure could benefit from simplification? So 61% think that it does. So we're not surprised. Um, it, it, it is definitely often an easier um, answer, even easier question to answer than actually to implement, to, to, to fix, due to thinking about the diligence, all of the various other aspects. But we're going to get to that shortly to outline how, how that, can, that itself as well can be simplified. And now the, the third question. What do you believe is the main obstacle to simplifying the corporate structure in your organization? Um, I'll start with the no obstacle. So that's just 12%. And 46% is all of the above, with availability of internal tax, legal, and compliance teams due to workload being the highest of that cohort. Um, again, that's, that's not necessarily that surprising. I think you'd, you'd probably agree with that, Sonia. Um, yeah, yeah. I thought legal costs might potentially be closer, but it, but it is it's workload. Um, I know it's something we all suffer from having having too much, um, but that's certainly a very interesting result. So thank you everybody for inputting, and I actually think that's a nice segue now, Bronya, into the conclusion, which is um, uh, which, which which I'll let you introduce. Thank you. Thank you. So if we just move on to the, the next slide. So corporate simplification. Why now? Why now? Why is it a good time? Um, I suppose my answer is probably why not now. Um, because Claire has set out, you know, the benefits of simplification and, you know, from the mitigation of risk, from the reduced cost, uh, from increased business efficiencies, um, and right down to, you know, hopefully unwinding some tax inefficiencies. So the earlier you start that process, the sooner you're going to enjoy the benefits. Um, so that's an important point. Um, I think the other, the other, the other aspect of why now. Is while some of you may be really busy in light of everything that's going on with COVID, um, some of you might find that your legal, your tax, your compliance teams actually have a slightly lighter workload. And the results of the poll there are you know, quite indicative of things that, that we often hear. So we often hear that look, we know our structure should be simplified. We just don't have the time to do it. You know, other teams are too busy to take on the due diligence of the team. Like, there just isn't the time. So maybe if your company does actually have a slightly lighter workload in light of everything that's going on with COVID, maybe this actually is a good time to do it. Um, and then the third, this is the third why now response that we think it's a good time to do it is when there is economic uncertainty and when there is a question, you know, a lot of employees are, are feeling maybe uncertain and a little bit anxious. An organization that can demonstrate it's taking steps to ensure long-term sustainability and putting a project in place and giving employees something to focus on can actually help to increase and improve employee motivation. Um, so I think that's a, that's a good synopsis of why we think this, this could be a good time to do it. Um, so if we look at the next slide, you know, 
Okay, so we've gone through the benefits, the different methods. Is it a good time now? Hopefully for your business, yes. But then what do you do? Like, what's the next step? So Claire and I have what we call like the five key steps of simplification. And step one is you're going to, you need to assess the efficiency of your corporate current structure against your business needs. So does your structure do what you want it to do? And then number two, you look, have to look at the cost to maintain your current structure. So some of you had a lower, let's say like under the two and a half thousand euro to maintain a company. But in our experience, it can actually be much higher by the time you weigh everything in. And that's only looking at the, the more kind of administrative costs. That doesn't take into the cost of employees or, or executive or management's time um, in dealing with the current, with the corporate structure. Um, so look at what the cost of your structure is and then look at the potential cost of simplifying your structure now and seeing how that's going to look over a long-term period. And then step three, I know I keep harping on about it, but you need to carry out internal due diligence. Like it's really important to know what that business does um, and what's in that company. And in doing the due diligence, you might actually realize, oh, that, that entity that we weren't really sure why it was in the business and we didn't think it was adding any value, but actually it has this asset and that's, we can, we can clearly see now why it's in the business. Perhaps that kind of got lost when the corporate memory has been sitting there for so long. And then step four, you need to draft a corporate simplification plan. So look at where you are now, look at where you want to be, and then determine with tax and with legal, the best method of getting there and the most efficient way for your business of getting to your simplified structure. And then at step five, you just need to implement the steps. Um, and hopefully having gone through those five steps, that's going to result in having a much improved corporate structure. And um, it's going to result in decreased costs for the organization as a whole and increased business efficiencies. So I says one thing that Claire and I have spoken a lot about this and you know, with what's going on with our, our clients at the moment with COVID and the economic uncertainty. Um, and we've actually developed a corporate simplification guide to try and help our clients. And um, so everyone attending today is going to receive our complimentary guide. And in that guide, we recap on the, so the five key benefits of simplification. We also prepared and developed some tools to allow you internally and your legal compliance, your tax teams to start that process yourselves. Um, because for the reasons that I set out before, perhaps they do have a lighter workload or perhaps it could be something that you could engage your employees in at the moment, which would, could result in cost savings to the group, but could also, also help your employees with their motivation and, and their um, focus. So the tools that accompany our guide are the simplification assessment. So that's going to allow you assess the efficiency of your current structure against your business needs, and will allow you to form a preliminary view of whether there are some companies within your structure that may actually be unnecessary. And then there's a cost saving calculator and you know that kind of does what it says in the tin and it allows you to assess the cost of maintaining your structure and allows you to assess the cost of or the potential cost in in simplifying your structure and then it's a due diligence questionnaire and that's going to allow you complete due diligence for addressing like i said the key heads that we would look at and some other questions to allow you really understand what's in your organization and then having done steps one to three if you feel that corporate simplification is something you would like to think further about, Claire and I are happy to assist you with steps four and five. And that's developing a plan and then implementing the steps. So Claire, I think that's a, a synopsis of, of, of corporate simplification and, and why now and why is it a good time and how you're going to go about doing it in the next steps. Thank you, Gronia. Um, I think we, we have some time now for, um, for some questions and um, we'll welcome back David, who's, um, who's going to, to, to assist us to the extent that, that we, we, there may be questions here relating to, to, to solvency and particularly actually at the moment. Um, so, Bonnie, I've got, I've got one for you, um, which, which, is, which is a very good question and it relates to a merger. Um, it, the question is, can you only merge an Irish limited into another Irish limited under the SAC, or is it possible to merge a foreign entity in under an Irish limited using the Irish domestic merger procedure? No, it's, it's only for Irish entities. So if you had, if you had an Irish entity and a you know, French entity, um, you'd have to use the, the cross-border regulations. 
which is where our, our domestic legislation stems from, but it's not the same. And, and the cross border doesn't have the, the SAP element. So that would have to be an application to court in both jurisdictions. And um, so I suppose you'd, when you look at merging entities cross border, it would want to be a sizable entity and it would, it would want to be worth the cost that you're going to incur because you're going to go into court in, in different jurisdictions. Thanks, Gornia. Um, we, have a, we have another question here on a merger that I might, um, I might take next. And then there's a couple, a couple related to the solvency declaration and then also the, 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 the solvency procedure. So, so let me just, um, um, sorry, I'm just navigating the questions here. Um, so in what circumstances, Gornia, would you choose to do a merger by absorption um, or by acquisition rather than a new entity merger? I'm getting all the questions. <laughs> um, I suppose merger by absorption and acquisition. You know, if you can do a merger by absorption, if you have that parent subsidiary relationship, that's the easier of the two because you don't have to consider the consideration element and allotting shares. And it, it doesn't matter greatly, but it's just a, an extra layer that you have to deal with. Um, but obviously, if you don't, if you can't do a merger by absorption because your sister entities or your I think sister entities, but you're not, you don't have that relationship, but then emerge by acquisition. And then for emerge by formation, to be honest, I've never had to do emerge by formation for corp simplification. And I suppose the reason for that is, like I said earlier, if you're, you're pushing co a company into the structure, which kind of takes away the whole purpose of simplification. So where, you, where you'd really see emerge by formation is more so if you had like two independent companies that wanted come together and set up this new entity. So it's not like that target acquire relationship. So you have two entities that come in and they, they both come in under this newly formed entity and, and a kind of fresh start and moving forward from them. I don't know if that answers your que <laughs> the question, but. Um, thanks, Gronia. Um, there are a couple of questions on the solvency declaration and generally about solvency. So what I might do is I might take the question on the solvency declaration and then, and then bring David in on, on the question of of, of, of when, when there is the, the possibility that the company might not be solvent. Um, so the question on, on the declaration of solvency is, if I am an employee director, what does it mean for me if I have to give it? I'm going to apply this to, to the, the solvency declaration generally. So we've mentioned that it, it, it applies in the SAP procedure, variants of which apply to each of the MDL and the, the domestic merger procedures. So generally, um, so directors, irrespective of if they're employee, non executive vet, um, if a director makes a declaration of solvency without having reasonable grounds for doing that, um, so that a court can on application of various parties, which would include a liquidator, creditor, director of corporate enforcement, they might declare that director personally responsible without any limitation of liability for all of the debts or other liabilities of the company. Um, and also, if the debts of a company um, in an MBL are not paid within 12 months after the commencement of the winding up, it is presumed that each director who made the declaration didn't have reasonable grounds for doing so. Now it can be rebutted, um, but the, the starting position is, 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 is that it is so presumed. So it is extraordinarily important that before giving a solvency declaration, the directors are confident that the company can pay its debts as they fall due for the subsequent period of 12 months. Um, the, um, the, there are ways of, of giving comfort. However, the, 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 the liability of directors will arise regardless. So the comfort you look for is for a parent guarantee, yes, to indemnify the director in respect of any loss they might incur, um, but also to ensure that the entity does not find itself in a position that it may not be able to pay its debts. So it's like a two-pronged approach in, in that it's, it's an undertaking to, to keep the company solvent um, or to allow it to pay its debts and, and, and also to indemnify the director. Um, so if the question arises that I'm not sure my company is solvent, what are my options or what are the options for the dissolution of that entity? I know it's a very broad question, David, um, but perhaps if you could give us a, a brief overview, also perhaps taking into account latitude generally in an insolvency situation or potentially during COVID, two kind of questions for you there, that would be super. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, and sorry, first of all, thank you, Cronin and Claire, for, for that presentation and for asking me to join you this morning. Um, I think I'll deal with the, the, the second part of that question first um, in relation to uh, possible attitude to directors um, 
where a company is at risk uh, in the current context due to COVID-19 or, or the pandemic. Um, so there's no real easy answer to that. Um, speaking, uh, directors owe duties to the company. However, in an insolvency context or where there's a prospect of an insolvency or a potential insolvency, a director's duties shift to the creditors of the company. So, for example, where a director becomes aware that a company is insolvent or potentially may be insolvent, they then have a duty to preserve the assets of the company, not to dissipate those assets. They have a duty not to make payments to themselves or to uh, make a favorable payment to one particular creditor to the detriment of the general creditors. Um, and they also have a duty to place that company into a creditor's voluntary liquidation. So that is uh, distinct from a member's voluntary liquidation, which we've been discussing earlier in this presentation, as an MVL is a solvent liquidation, whereas a creditor's voluntary liquidation is the insolvent uh, equivalent process. So the duties of directors are enshrined in legislation and through case law, and they really remain the same. However, there, there have been some indications of late. Um, there's been guidance issued from the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement, which uh, indicates that there's going to be a slight relaxation in the context of a company that runs into financial difficulty as a consequence of the pandemic. So that guidance suggests that uh, a director will be less likely to face adverse consequences where an insolvency uh, occurs due to events outside of their control. Um, so example, for example, a company that has resumed or is about to resume trading now after a period of closure will be given some leeway if there is a reasonable prospect that it would be able to trade out of its difficulties in a relatively short time frame. But the reality is that that is a precarious situation and I would urge any director uh, of a company that, that may be insolvent or there may be question marks over solvency to, to take professional advice, not necessarily legal advice, but certainly um, advice from accountancy professionals. And um, aside from the solvent members voluntary liquidation process, there are other processes. Uh, creditors voluntary liquidation is the insolvent process. Uh, there are also various restructuring tools available under Irish law um, from a consensual restructuring um, between the company and its members and creditors to uh, the corporate rescue procedures uh, such as examinership or schemes of arrangement. Thank you very much for that, David. That's very helpful. Um, so before we let you go, there's, there's, there's two more questions. One is, is, is actually quite specific. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll email a response to that person. Um, so I think we, we, we probably can, can give you a steer, um, which leaves us with one question and it veers into tax, which is, which is not our, our necessarily our strong area, but I'll have a go. And um, it's quite a specific one, but it has come up on a number of occasions with, with the mergers that we've done with active, active trading entities. So with a merger where the trades are the same, can trading losses from the merged entity be used going forward by the successor entity? And the, the simple answer is yes, but it is limited. So you're into an analysis of, of, of the trades um, to, to make sure that they are the same and the extent to which the trade of the entity that's merging um, into the other entity will continue. Um, but there is a, an ability, but an analysis does need to be done and care does need to be exercised. exercised. But yes, it is certainly something that can be explored. So that is the end of our questions today. Um, Again, thank you all for joining. Um, thank you, David, for, for, for joining us as well. Um, that, 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 was a, that was a big help. Um, and you will all, as Gronya said, re receive our complimentary guide. Um, and we, 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 look ho we will forward hopefully from, to, to, we look forward hopefully to hearing from some of you again soon. Um, have a good day and thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.